lovely people we are back and I'm making this video because there was a special request and I'm going to I'm going to laugh um, we just did thermal process validation in class and you may have seen the video about doing the DZ and uh, T reference calculations and tracking the time temperature parameters of a food product and using um, computer modeling to validate if that product has had sufficient lethality and a student uh, I'll, I'll say it, Michelle said oh I'm so glad we didn't do potatoes I heard last year they did potatoes and guess what we aren't going to do potatoes this year but I want to talk about the principle of behind what we did with the potato um, demonstration in the class and this is actually a really great demonstration because it, it uh, pulls together elements from our process engineering class as well as our innovation class to think about where technology is taking the food manufacturing sector. And so where are we going today? At the end of this video, you'll be able to discuss the difference between predictive calculation versus observation-centered calculation of thermal processes and the difficulty of predictive modeling of non-ideal systems. And what on earth does that mean? Well, you know, I often say we are focused on outcomes basis in this class. We are um, back when I had to take this class in university, we did so much of the work on um, predictive modeling. And so we would think about what would that food look like and we would do all these calculations. And then if you go out and try and do an experimental design based off of it, the experimental observations would sometimes, but not always, correlate to the mathematical work that we did. More often, what I've seen in industries, they're focused on outcomes based. I use the analogy um, when I went in my inspection career and I said, oh, well, let's let's do all the thermal diffusivity calculations. And they're like, uh, no, we just stick thermometers in the product. So that's what that means. We're going to also discuss applications of statistical process control with relation to thermal processes. and. Uh, those of you who have been following along, we will talk about our histograms and shoe heart or control charts as a means of integrating all of this together. Last but not least, Wilson identifies some technology applications such as SCADA and ERP that integrate statistical process control for operations management. If we have these sorts of observations, we can start to have sensors, we can start to have uh, PLCs, pro programmable logical controllers, oversee these observations for us so that it can all link into a computer system and as food scientists we can work with the computer programmers the operations managers the uh, process engineers we can go in there and say here are the parameters that we'd like the uh, logic controller to uh, modify this process and this is i think a really huge growth area and it's something that as food scientists we really need to be aware of and be ready to interact with. So let's move on here. Uh, back when I went to school, we had to do all these specific heat capacity calculations. And so we'd have the specific heat it would be multiplied by the uh, fraction of the compositional analysis. And the idea behind this is that for every gram of fat or ash or carbohydrate, there's a specific amount of heat energy that's necessary to raise that food so many degrees and cook it and we would we would then do all the like btu calculations on different heating operations and this is this is great if you are designing the manufacturing equipment but what we what we normally see in the industry is food scientists product developers um, uh, entrepreneurs who are building out processes will go to an equipment manufacturer and say here's what i want to do and the equipment manufacturer then has the engineers and I love you guys, uh, all of you process engineers out there, fantastic, you do a great job. I am not training process engineers um, per se, I am training food product developers, I am training food scientists who need to interact with those engineers. So this calculation works great on ideal foods and ideal shapes, and um, in many foods, there's not exactly an ideal food. What do I mean by an ideal food? Um, Usually what we mean is that it's homogenous. So 
when I say homogeneous, that it is sis, uh, systematically and compositionally the uniform. So this ash carbohydrate protein lipid water is going to be uniform on every single bit of that product. And in the real world, we know that if I, let's say, want to have an apple, um, there's a core in that apple, there's peel in that apple, the moisture content of one apple may be slightly different than the next apple. Maybe I'm not doing apple, maybe I'm doing bone in ham. Now suddenly, where is that ash content? Is it in the bone? Is it in the muscle? Is it uh, the lipids definitely not distributed evenly? You could have a fat cap on that bone in ham and it's going to heat differently than the muscular or the bone in portion of that ham. And as such, the ideal food is rare. It's, it, it is out there. Most beverages are considered ideal foods because they're reasonably uniform in their composition. Uh, if you pour one glass of milk, it's going to be the same as this, the next glass of milk as long as it's the same lot and the same fat composition and the same solids composition. But what on earth does this look like? Well, let me just escape out of here. And again, I joke that we're friends at this point. I was listening to some music before it came on here. I am going to what's called the engineering toolbox. And this is a great website that's got all sorts of different um, engineering tables that once upon a time you used to find in different engineering guidebooks. Um, I was able to, um, uh, before you could get this table from uh, Heldman and Singh's uh, food engineering book. But uh, there we go. And the idea being there is a specific heat capacity on each of these different food products that a plant engineer could use. So for example, you could say, if I need to heat up an avocado, it's going to take 3.01 kilojoules per kilogram per degree Celsius. So if I want to increase my avocados by 10 degrees, it's going to take 30 point, uh, let's see, 30.1 kilojoules per kilogram to get it that additional 10 degrees Celsius increase. And the specific heat is different depending on if it is uh, liquid water or if it is ice. <laughs> Solid water was what I was going to say. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's been a long week. Um, and so each of the different foods has a different specific heat. And what, what's interesting about these tables is that the specific heat, while it does take into account it does take into account the fractional composition. Let's jump back to my slide here. Uh, I got too many slideshows going on. Let's jump back to my slide here. It does take into account the role of water. You'll notice in the equation, water has a dominant effect. One, water is the largest macronutrient in most food products, but it also, from a fractional perspective, it takes more energy to heat up a degree of water. And so water proportionately has the most impact on the specific heat. Uh, lipid to a lesser extent, protein to an even lesser extent, carbohydrate even less than protein, and ash the lowest amount in terms of um, how it's contributing to the heating profile of this food product. The big challenge again, so very few foods are ideal foods and it's, uh, those the specific heat tables are are nice to make an estimate. So let's say you're a process engineer and you need to think, well, how much heat is it going to take me to heat up the smokehouse to cook that chicken to 84 degrees Celsius if that chicken is going in at four degrees from the free refrigerator? That's great, except you're also losing heat on the external uh, walls of the process. You're losing heat through the... Uh, ventilation stack, you are losing heat to um, other, other items. items. Uh, and so it's not a perfect efficiency uh, to be able to do these specific heat calculations. I want people to be aware of them and I want people to realize that they are incredibly important, but I want to focus on outcomes-based calculations. And so what on earth does this look like? Well, that's, oh, this is my sensible versus latent versus sensible heat um, diagram here. and. And we have to think about that heat 
application to a product, in many cases, it's being applied as sensible heat, and then it goes to latent heat. And that's where you're at. The heat that's applied to the product is causing a change of state in that product. And again, in most food products, that's going to be water. And so are we seeing that change of state? I, I set the y-axis here so that uh, the change of state was happening at zero. So we're assuming we're applying sensible heat to a frozen product. Then the heat is uh, going to latent heat and melting the product's ice or water, solid water fraction. And then the sensible heat increases after all of the ice has melted. The challenge with uh, complex food products too is that there are multiple phases of uh, latent heat application. So for example, in foods with a large amount of fat, that fat can go through a change of state as well. And we modeled this in uh, a previous, previous demonstration where we had uh, a jar of fat. It was just a jar of fat, to be quite honest. And we tracked its uh, um, change in, uh, changing uh, sensible heat perception over time and we could see this plateau of latent heat as that fat was going through its melting phase and then the sensible heat increased again when the when the when the melting phase had occurred in many food products fat is a major component within that food product and it often goes through that latent heat phase therefore that's also not always accounted for in those specific heat tables that the engineering toolbox is is showing so it's worth considering the fact that very few foods are ideal foods and that's why we focus on outcomes and statistical process control now last year in the in this class i made the students do a, a statistical process control on potatoes why because i can buy 10 pounds of potatoes for three bucks um and so we wired up a potato with a thermocouple and we tracked its temperature and we tracked it until it hit, I believe, 95 degrees. And we considered that a cooked potato when the internal temperature was 95 degrees. And we're then able to track the time to temperature and identify how long does it take a potato to cook. The challenge is a potato is not a potato is not a potato. And so we wired up a whole lot of different potatoes. We had little potatoes and we had long potatoes and we had fat potatoes and skinny potatoes. And, and this is normal that in food processing, very few foods exhibit ideal characteristics. And as such, statistical process control makes a lot of sense. We wired up all those potatoes, we put them in the rationale and we tracked the time to completion on those potatoes. And with that time to completion, we can put it into a histogram and then be able to uh, determine with a statistical process control, um, we can determine what is the completion of cook time. We can, we can go back to those potatoes and we can say, well, what happens if we overlay an additional parameter? So let's say we only want potatoes that are in this size range can we, can we um, disaggregate that data or segregate that data to see if the potatoes that are within, let's say, 10 centimeters to 15 centimeters in size, or maybe 100 grams to 120 grams, do those have an even more discrete, if we, uh, more discrete histogram in terms of the data representation? This is the sort of thing that as a food product developer, you then may have to go and set a specification on your incoming potatoes saying those potatoes must be 100 to 120 grams for this process to uh, be fulfilled. But then you also have to work backwards to make sure that a supplier can actually meet that tolerance for you consistently. So pardon me, I'm going to cough here. I'm going to mute. going to carry on. Hey, the mute button's useful. So what on earth could you also do? You could also do a Schuhart or um, X-bar R type uh, graphing on your potatoes. And this, this graph is just clip art that I got off of the internet. But let's say you've got day one and you are tracking your potatoes. You can uh, identify if the process is in control and um, 
within those specifications, or you can start to see if there are changes within that log, identifying back out to other parameters that may be occurring. Did your supplier on your potatoes change? Was preventative maintenance done on your uh, cooking system? Um, did you have a change in the operator? Just to, you can, you can log these things out to make sure that your process is consistently within uh, standard control and cross-reference it to the types of operations that are occurring. The nice thing about this type of approach is these thermocouples are no, uh, yeah, they could be old school wired to a standalone thermometer or a standalone thermocouple and manually read, but more often than not anymore, these are these thermocouples are linked into a programmable logic controller and these are computer integrated um, data readers and what's really awesome about this is that it eliminates a lot of the error that could be occurring from an operator going out onto the plant floor and having to read all those thermocouples. I know uh, working with students oftentimes they'll say oh the thermometer is changing up and down what temperature do I write in or they'll uh, uh, maybe the student's feeling lazy and they read one thermometer and they put that number into all six boxes. Um, honestly, uh, there are so much uh, opportunity for technology to be reducing the amount of human error that's occurring in data collection. And in the case of time temperature data logging, the uh, ability to uh, link into a programmable logic controller is extremely uh, extremely common within the industry and then what's really cool about that and moving forward is that oftentimes they're linked into uh, SCADA systems and so SCADA is where you're doing uh, integrated computer control for an entire system and oftentimes food uh, food scientists food processing specialists need to work within the plant team oftentimes uh, collaborating with SCADA programmers so that they're setting the tolerances on processes and then that SCADA programmer is going to be out uh, programming the master uh, computer configuration so that the, uh, the processes are controlled according to the tolerances set by the, the food scientist or the, or the quality assurance manager. And I had a, just a little video to leave us off with. Uh, this is a little video of a of a SCADA type system where you've got all of these different uh, valves or augers turning on and off depending on the uh, the parameters of the system and you could have all sorts of different uh, all sorts of different meters on that system knowing where uh, where things need to be knowing at what time or temperature or pressure or pH or um, any number of different process related parameters, these are the sorts of sensors that could be on a process changing if a valve turns on or off or if a, if a hopper is going to dump or not. And I realize this is a really, really high level conversation at this point, but this is, this is where the technology is leading in so many food manufacturing operations, especially within large corporations. The, the challenge I'm training food scientists, especially I'm training food product developers, you need to be able to have a really good conversation with the SCADA programmer to be able to say it's at this time or at this temperature or at this weight or this pH that the machine is going to turn on or turn off or discharge its load or turn a pump on or turn a valve on. And I can't, I, I think the biggest take home message from this is to start to hone in on those sorts of measurements that could be controlled in some form of um, programmable logic controller or SCADA controller such that uh, you've got to have the conversation with that programmer or you've got to learn the programming and that's sort of outside of the scope of this uh, of this program but that said there's uh, some an incredible computer programming uh, courses that Niagara College and a few other schools around the area offer. I highly encourage you to take a deeper investigation into this and I may have some more videos coming up about this topic as well. So 
those of you who missed the potatoes, ah, oh, you got the potatoes in the end, and I will leave you with my, I just had so much fun drawing all those thermocouples and potatoes, and I love potatoes. I'll leave you with that. So uh, ask good questions. I do love to hear your ideas for next videos, and keep on learning, and we'll talk to you soon.